start of a brand new series, A Tale of Two Stuart S50 Steam Engines. This is part one. A Stuart Models factory machine kit and the other one is not. It is a much older version. Both of these engines need some attention in quite different ways. Even though these engines are both Stuart S50 models, they are not identical. The first one to look at is the factory machine kit. Here it is on a wooden plinth. And it looks quite nice. The colours are a bit of a puzzle though. If you look at the flywheel, it's a different green to the body of the engine. And when I spoke to Stuart Models on the phone, I was told that the newer Stuart S50 models had a black flywheel. Why is this one just a different shade of green to the rest of the engine? I don't know. Believe me, that is the least of my worries with this engine. Not only is the flywheel a different colour, it's a very wobbly flywheel. I think I need to take a closer look at this. It's easier to see the problem if I turn the engine round. What's wrong with it? Is the crankshaft bent? No, I don't think so. The crankshaft bearings, which are cast into the main part of the engine, are very badly worn indeed. I've never seen one this bad. You can clearly see when I move it by hand how much it's actually moving. The entire thing is even worse than a rattle fit. The fix is fairly straightforward. I'm going to drill out and then rebush the bearings. The first thing I'd like to do is to show a comparison between the two engines. They are different in quite a few ways. The modern factory machine kit. This is fitted with a new type of flywheel. The cylinder is made from cast iron with a gunmetal steam chest and a cast iron steam chest cover. The crankshaft is 9 30 seconds of an inch in diameter. Now for the earlier version of the S50. This is fitted with a different type of flywheel. The cylinder is made entirely from gunmetal with a gunmetal steam chest cover and the crankshaft is a quarter of an inch in diameter. As you can see from the images, the bed plates are the same, but there are several differences between the engines. This older model isn't very well finished, I haven't done much at it. It's painted in a really attractive red primer colour, and really the fettling of the casting should have been carried out before painting the engine. I'm going to put this right in the fullness of time. It hasn't done much running, there's hardly any wear on the crankshaft, quite unlike the green one, which in its time has done quite a lot of running. It was used to drive a generator and the problem with miniature steam engines driving generators is they have to go quite fast. Probably about this speed and all you have to do is forget to oil the engine a couple of times and it will wear out quickly. When I run the engine that looks a bit rough and is painted in primer, it sounds a lot better than the green one. With some compressed air still admitted to the engine, I've stopped it so I can check where the timing is set. This wants a bit of adjustment, but I'll leave it for now. I'm going to have a closer look at the green engine. And in order to do that, I need to dismantle it. Starting by using an Allen key to remove the grub screw that secures the flywheel to the crankshaft. I've already done a bit of work on this engine in an earlier episode. I just made a mental note that the crankshaft was worn out. And just look at it, the amount of wear is extreme. And as I previously mentioned, it was used to drive a dynamo. Here's the dynamo, taken from a bicycle, which was used to power these LED lights in this diorama. There was also a Cotswold Heritage Perseus mounted on the same board as the Stuart S50, as you can see here. But the small dynamo on the Perseus only gave out one and a half volts and was really feeble. I removed both of the steam engines from the mounting board, put the Perseus engine in a safe place. Now it's top tip time. This is a very simple tip and it's hardly worth mentioning. It's just common sense. What you often find when you try and remove a flywheel is it doesn't come off the crankshaft quite as easily as you thought. I've wrapped a screwdriver in a piece of kitchen roll and I place this underneath the connecting rod which fixes it in one position so I can gently remove the flywheel because the grub screw had marked the crankshaft so the flywheel was a little bit stiff. A bit of a warning though here, only use this method for very light duty jobs. I removed the crankshaft from the flywheel 
and here are two fibre washers, which are a bit of a waste of time really. These were put in place behind the flywheel up against the bearing to stop the flywheel moving into the wooden plinth. But looking at them has given me a good idea. I need to drill out the bearings to a larger size and then sleeve them with a 9 32nds of an inch diameter hole down the middle, but I may as well make them longer than normal. If you have a look at the three double-ended arrows, you will notice that I can sleeve the bearing and make the bearing longer at both ends. The new bearing at the flywheel end can start off being a bit larger diameter externally and then go through the larger holes I'm going to drill all the way to where the eccentric is and although the bearing won't be quite as large I can do the same thing at the other end at the other side of the eccentric. On this engine I'd already dispensed with the slot headed grub screws. Instead I fitted Allen grub screws and in this clip I'm slackening the one that holds the eccentric sheave to the crankshaft. The next part of the job is to slacken off the crank pin and in this clip you can see that because the crank pin is a normal right hand thread and because it's threaded into the crank web the flywheel on this S50 engine needs to rotate in a clockwise direction not the normal anti-clockwise direction which could loosen the crank pin and the resultant thrashing about of the connecting rod while the engine slowed to a stop could possibly do quite a lot of damage to certain parts of the engine. In this clip, because of the burr on the crankshaft, I'm winding it out of the eccentric sheave to remove it. Although in the end, this was very tight in the eccentric sheave, so I used a brass bolt to gently tap the crankshaft through the sheave. Here I'm using a digital micrometer to see what the size of the crankshaft is. And to be perfectly honest, numbers are not my strong point. I'm only using this micrometer to see how badly the crankshaft is worn, and surprisingly, it's hardly worn at all. And the bearing surface of the crankshaft is in very good order. I'm only using the needle file to remove the burrs from the crankshaft, where the eccentric sheave and the flywheel's grub screw damage the shaft. As far as I can see, this crankshaft, although it doesn't look absolutely brilliant, is in very good order. Dimensionally, it's fine, and I will be reusing it. Provided, of course, that it isn't bent. I'll check that in the lathe before I go any further. And this is the story so far. I'd just like to say stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.